Hi, everybody, and welcome to a special edition of the Hump Day Coffee Break. Uh, we're using GoToWebinar today because, unfortunately, Facebook doesn't do a split-screen interview yet. Okay, Sometime, someday they will, um, and, uh, but for now, we're going to use GoToWebinar. So thank you so much, uh, everybody, for signing up and registering. we got a, a pretty good crowd here today, and I'm really happy to have a couple of really great people on live. Uh, Beth Cantor and Elisa Sherman, and they are the author of the Happy Healthy Nonprofit, which some of you may already know about, and hopefully maybe you even have a copy yourself. Um, so we're going to get right down to it. I'm just going to introduce them very quickly. Beth Cantor, I don't think she needs an introduction. If you do a Google search on Beth, she will be the second result right after the KISS song. Okay, um, I refer to her as the uh, kind of the the queen of everything, nonprofit social media, the, the king and queen, and you know, the top of the uh, Mount Everest, if you like. She's an author, um, speaker, trainer, thought leader for sure. For, for a lot of people, I think most people in the nonprofit technology uh, you know, community see her as the kind of the tip of the spear, basically. And then we have Eliza Sherman. Uh, she's also an author, and she's written a lot of books. She actually started her own uh, internet company in the 90s, a female-owned, woman-owned uh, internet company in the 90s. She's been around for a long time. She's got tremendous amounts of experience, and together, the two of them have uh, published a book, The Happy Healthy Nonprofit. So why don't you guys go ahead and take it away? All right. That sounds great. Thank you so much, John. And this is Eliza. I'm going to get started. And this is Beth. <laughs> Oh, there's Beth. Yeah, so, yeah. Well, I wanted to tell you a little bit about our book. So the Happy Healthy Nonprofit, we consider it a manifesto for a mindset and culture shift in the nonprofit sector. And we're starting a conversation around the importance of self-care for nonprofit professionals. The reason for self-care, to avoid burnout and to gain more sustainable energy for your work and for your life. So we also talk about the importance of we care. So the first half of the book is about self-care. The second half is about we care, the organizational imperative to pay attention to and commit to encouraging staff to take care of themselves. Because as a social change activist, if you do not care for yourself first, you won't be able to care for others. So next slide. Great. So this is Beth. And um, so let's just uh, define self-care for a moment. It's really all about revitalization. And it includes any deliberate and consistent habits you create to enhance your overall well-being. Um, self-care self helps you deal with stress. And it really starts with the awareness of how you relate to yourself and the world around you. Um, so um, in the book, we talk about it as the five spheres of happy, healthy living. And it's more than just focusing on your physical health or wellness, although that's a really an important on-ramp to happy, healthy. And Elisa will talk about that in a moment. But in our book, um, these five spheres um, are different areas of our life that we need to really pay uh, more attention to. So we have self, which does include physical health, downtime, creativity, and a lot of other things. Um, your relationship with other people in your lives, that's family, friends, community. Your relationship to the environment. Um, and this is your home, your office space, getting out outdoors. And, um, and of course, to work and money, um, how you relate to other people at work, how uh, productivity, and how your culture supports this well-being. And of course, a newer addition, um, tech. So the book covers um, both uh, based on interviews with nonprofit professionals, how to practice self-care, and we care in all of those areas. So if we drill down a little bit further now, so we Beth just talked about the larger framework of the book. So if we drill down further, we look at the wellness triad. Now, a lot of experts talk about the wellness triad. These are the three basic foundations of wellness and well-being. Without these three things as human beings, we cannot sustain all the energy, focus, attention, productivity, any of the things we talk about that we want to do 
uh, in the nonprofit sector. So the wellness triad consists of sleep, nutrition, and fitness. And if we were to pick one of them, I think Beth and I would agree the one place to start to really focus on is sleep. And Beth has a couple of tips about that. Great. Next slide. Next slide. <laughs> Next slide. <laughs> oh, there we go. Okay. So protect your sleep. I, I, another way to say this is protect the asset, which is you. Okay. So um, culture blogger uh, Maria Popova of Brain Pickings. I don't know if any of you read her blog. It's amazing. But she said something that really uh, resonated with us. Um, it's that we tend to wear our ability to get by on little sleep as some sort of badge of honor that validates our work ethic. But really, what it is is a profound failure of self-respect and priorities. Now, according to the CDC, insufficient sleep is one of their uh, top ten public health problems. Okay, so sleep deprivation, that is skimping on our needed sleep, does not let us perform or do our best for our organizations because when we function on less than the required amount of sleep, it's like showing up to work drunk or otherwise cognitively impaired. Now, is that in the best interest of serving your clients or stakeholders? So um, how much sleep do you need? Okay, so the amount of hours per night varies from individual to individual. And the difference typically is based on age. Um, as we get older, the less sleep we need. Um, the National Sleep Foundation, uh, which does research and also champions sleep, recommends that adults um, need between seven and nine hours of sleep per night. Okay, so some of you may know my work um, in Measuring the Network nonprofit, know that I'm a data nerd, and also that I'm a big fan of the Fitbit. And Fitbit actually can track the number of hours of sleep you get and also your sleep quality. So I use that to start, when I decide to commit to, I'm going to get, try to get that seven to nine hours of sleep. I started tracking um, the number, the amount of sleep I got, the quality of sleep um, against my moods and productivity. And I found that my sweet spot was seven hours and 45 minutes of sleep. So in order to commit to that, I had to rethink my nighttime routine. Okay, so rather than trying to squeeze in, you know, 20 more emails so I'd be ahead of the game tomorrow or uh, work late into the night on a proposal or something or a presentation that was due the next morning, I decided to cut off electronics a couple hours before bed. And in order to do that, I had to switch to an old-fashioned alarm clock <laughs> instead of using my iPhone because what I would do is check my email before bed, and that ended up disrupting my sleep. So with this awareness and tracking, I was able to change my routine, and I'm getting better sleep, and I know that I'm functioning better. And I hope you will do the same. So next slide. Uh, the other part of the triad is, of course, fitness. And one way to do that is um, to get more movement or stand more at work. And so as it's been said, sitting is the new smoking. And so be, sitting with your butt in the seat for eight or nine or 12 hours a day, even without getting up or to, you know, to walk around, that's dangerous to your health. It can lead to problems like heart disease, cancer, muscle problems, brain fog, yuck. Who wants that? The one simple fix is the standing desk, and it doesn't have to be um, expensive. So as you can see in the photograph there, my colleague, Beverly Trainer, she hacked a standing desk from a, a, a cardboard carton and a music stamp. And if you follow that link, you'll find lots of ideas for inexpensive um, standing desks. But let me give you a couple of pro tips. First of all, get a foot pad because you'll get sore feet if you're not used to standing. Also, make sure that you have the correct ergonomic posture because you don't want to create more problems for yourself. And there's a, if you go to that resource page, there's a, a, a diagram that shows you the correct standing posture at your desk. You'll also want to experiment um, with what tasks are best done standing. For me, I like to do email or call standing or even sessions like this. But when I'm writing, I like to sit. And one final tip comes from uh, the ergonomic lab at Cornell University is once you start to use a standing desk, um, one way to think about it, and especially if it's adjustable like Beverly's, um, is to sit for 20 minutes, stand for eight minutes, and then stretch for two. So next slide. Along with standing, it's also important to think about how you can work, incorporate work into your um, workday. Um, the CDC recommends that we get 
2.5 hours per week of moderate exercise. So walking every day for 30 minutes can really boost your health. And I know this firsthand. Um, so where do you find the time in your work day to do this? Okay, the first tip is don't use your computer keyboard as a lunch tray. Stop thinking of solo walking as exercise. You know, it's a great time to think about a challenging work task or just think through something. So really, that time away from your computer, you're actually working. Um, the other thing is to learn how to listen to your body. Recognize when you're not productive sitting and take a five-minute walk around your office. Take a stretch. And of course, there's many, many, many other ways to incorporate walking as work, and we describe these in detail in the book. These are things like walking meetings, doing calls on your mobile phone, et cetera. So uh, two tips, uh, three tips, actually. Protect your sleep, get a standing desk, and walk more. And now we'll talk about technology wellness. Um, Aliza? So yes, this is my, I would call my pet topic, is tech wellness. The major thing that you could do today is to get into a habit of unplugging regularly. Technology has become a compulsion for us. It is interfering with the way we communicate. Like we think it's a great communications device, but we're actually not communicating with the people right in front of us or paying attention to the people who are in the meeting around us. We're being distracted. That's called technoference. So we're constantly being interrupted. Our brain has no chance to focus. It has no chance to rest. So just unplugging on a regular basis from your electronics is a great way to combat the compulsive behavior now that we're getting from our electronics. Next slide. So here's a tip of what I actually do at my house. I've set up a charging station, and, and if you put your charging station for all your family's electronic devices at the door, so as soon as you walk in, you take it out of your bag or take it out of your hand, because most of us are carrying it around with us everywhere, and we plug it in. Then when you have to use it again, it's a very deliberate process to walk across the hall, down the hall, to the door to get it. It gives you a time to be mindful. Am I being compulsive? Do I need to reach for that phone? Am I making a call or am I just going to check Facebook? So going for that walk through the house, that mindful moment, gives you a chance to really rethink how often you're reaching for your phone in a space where you should be resting at your house. Next slide, please. And then no electronics in the bedroom. It's such a simple thing, but none of us are doing this. We have allowed electronics to invade our bedroom. Now, I also, my husband's a hunter, so I have the no dead animals in the bedroom rule, but I really try to enforce, and I'm not always successful myself, but the don't bring your mobile device in. Don't bring your tablet in. It's such an easy habit. We, we used to watch TV, and now we're checking our emails. And, and I think Beth was mentioning don't use the iPhone as your alarm clock. It's this compulsion. It's there. And so we reach for it. We try to grab it. So as long as you reserve your bedroom as a true place of rest, your brain will have some time to just decompress. So those are some of the very concrete and also simple I put those in quotation mark tips that we use, but Beth, go ahead. Um, sure. I think, um, so we just gave you a small little taste of uh, what's in the book. And, um, and we just want to take like, a mindful moment now just to think about maybe some of these ideas or others that you can incorporate into your work life right now or, or life in general um, to be happier and healthier. And I think, John, we can also open this up now for questions. Brilliant. I love it. Oh, wow. You know what I really like about this is that this is stuff that you can do right away. Um, and I, and I, I love it. So I'm going to open it up for questions. I know that there was one question from Tricia. Um, she actually sent me this question by email. And I'm going to read it. Um, it says, how can you create um, and how can you create and maintain self-care as a part of a small office where pressure is more intense? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, Beth, why don't you address it first in terms of just organizationally and the culture? Um, sure, sure. Um, well, I was going to um, 
um, jump to an immediate solution. But first of all, it, oh, good. Uh, if it's yeah. a small office, <laughs> over, you know, if it's a small office, I don't know if Tricia is the executive director or if she is another employee, but it really has to be a, um, a organizational whole commitment, starting with leaders, the board. And I think it really starts with understanding what your collective organizational capacity is and making um, an agreement that you're not going to exceed it. Um, now, now, with that said, of course, there's always times of the year that are really crazy. There's the annual benefit. There's, when, there's some big grant proposals are due. But I think having that, um, that understanding about um, what is the collective capacity and understanding what are the organizational priorities and really trying to stick to those and letting some of the other things go. Now, in terms of um, a solution, um, in the book, we have a, um, an assessment uh, for burnout, um, which helps educate nonprofits about the symptoms of burnout. Uh, we didn't really touch on that too much, but it does start with that. Plus, we have a self-care inventory, um, which goes through, and it's organized, it's based on hundreds of interviews with um, nonprofit professionals about how they practice self-care both themselves and in the workplace. And uh, recently, um, a small uh, arts organization that I've been working with took that. Um, there's been maybe three people on staff. They did the assessment, and then they also did the inventory, and they created um, self-care plans. And then they became their own accountability buddies in, in implementing it. So, um, so it really begins with um, sort of an organization-wide commitment to it uh, with the leaders and also staff. Yeah, and I think that that was I was going to give something more general like that. If, if all of you within that small office make a commitment together, you know, Beth talks about the accountability buddy thing. But if you make a commitment together that on a regular basis, on a daily basis, you do something jointly to bring relaxation or to bring movement into the office. Uh, one of the organizations rings a bell and then everyone in the whole organization gets up and they go for a walk together each day. Or have that bell prompt all of you to come together and just pause, just take a pause and bring that tension and that level down so that you're all really looking out not just for yourself but for one another and create an environment, a culture where those moments of care uh, really help everyone thrive more and feel less stressed and less pressured. Brilliant. Okay. I have a comment here from Sue. Sue says, and I love this, she said, I love the idea that self-care is self-respect. And we have a question from Randy, um, and actually I kind of resonate with this question. Um, can, you address the very, can you address the very social IT worker who finds themselves now working remotely with no coworker face-to-face -face contact. Mm. Oh, God. Oh, God. I think I've lived that life for the last 25 uh, years. So have I. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. when I got started, John, you know, I, I would say, you know, I had a front row seat at the creation of the nonprofit tech field, and I was working remotely, as, as was Eliza, uh, for an organization called Artswire. And one of the things that I learned that I had to do <laughs> was to make trips into the office on purpose. <laughs> Um, just, you know, so I would plan one or two days a week where, you know, I could go down to the office. Um, in some cases, I was working remotely in Boston with the organization in New York, and I, I did that uh, once every other month. And then um, I also made an effort, so I wasn't so isolated, because um, isolation and loneliness can also be stressful, um, just to get out of the, um, the house if you're working at home. Um, there's something called Popcorn Workstation. I don't know if you've done this. Um, it's you, um, you take your laptop out, and you don't bring your, your cable. You bring it fully charged, um, and you go to one coffee shop, and you work until your battery runs down, <laughs> and then you have another coffee shop that you go to that's at least 10 blocks away, and you walk to that, <laughs> and then you work for another hour and a half. Um, and you do that maybe three, three rotations. And so that gets a walk-in. You're out with other people, and you get work done. I love yeah, it. Yeah, and I think... Yeah, I, I I hadn't even heard that, Beth. I love that technique. I sort of did that. And in fact, in my notes right now to respond to this question, I was going to say, well, what I do is I vary up my workplace and I make sure I have human contact. And so I might go to my favorite cafe and work there for lunch. In fact, that's where I was yesterday when I had a phone call with Beth and somebody else. 
for a virtual meeting, and then I might go to a, a coffee shop and just and just I'm just constantly varying it up. Or I ask a client, "Do you mind if I work at your office for a little while?" Then I have the hustle and bustle of of their staff around me, and the other piece of it too is back to the Fitbit that Beth mentioned. I don't have a Fitbit uh, wristband, but I have the Fitbit app on my phone. And so I am in competition almost all the time with Beth, who can keep up with Beth and her 15,000 to 20,000 steps a day. But it's a constant reminder to me, get up, walk around, because you're in competition with Beth. So that it's a little bit of a, a team effort. And I also am on the Fitbit competing with friends in Australia and other parts of the world. And that is, to me, a fitness cue, a team effort, and it's movement in my day. I lose all the time, though, I have to admit. <laughs> One, one thing that I've done, actually, because I've had my own business uh, since like 2009 working out, out of my home, basically a home office, and I found that I needed to really be around people, so I actually rent uh, a co-working space in Kendall Square. Um, Beth used to live in Cambridge, or actually Boston, Cambridge area. So I live in Harvard Square. I get on my bike. I ride to Kendall Square. I'll work for, say, three to five hours, and then I'll come back home. And uh, that has made a tremendous difference in just feeling re-energized and connected with people. Um, you know, I think that's really important. And it's also yeah, I agree. good when you work out of your home. Um, I mean, there's pluses and minuses and, and how well you're, you're, you uh, navigate different boundaries. You know, some people find it, you know, they get distracted. Other people find that they're working all the time. And I just felt, uh, found that, I do have a home office, but having a door to close <laughs> and having it in a certain section of the house, and that's work, you know, and then leave work. So that's really great, John. I love that story. And I have another question and comment here from Lindsay. Lindsay's asking, how do you take a break from screens, social media at work when your job is social media? I can tell it affects my eyes, overall health, but it is a large percent of my work. And then she says, help. Explanation point. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, you know, the, oh gosh, I had that problem <laughs> being, you know, in social media. And so what I, when I, what I did is I, I, um, I used this um, uh, thing called Altradian Rhythms, which is basically your productivity uh, goes in um, 90 minute or 120 minute spurts, and then your body and your brain needs like a 10 to 20 minute break, even if you're just walking around your desk or getting up. So when I'm doing, uh, doing social media or I'm working heavily online, which I do a lot, I, I, I design my day in these spurts so that I get my hour and a half of productivity and then I sit back and I take a break for 20 minutes. I disengage from the screen. It's like rebooting your brain. So you need to build in these kind of brain breaks. And I actually just wrote a blog post about that. Um, so try to... The problem is, is that when you are in social media and you are online, you kind of get like into this, um, addiction thing because you're there and you can't leave and you, you feel you're exhausted and you're not paying attention after two hours or three hours at the screen but you need to like listen to your body and disengage um, another thing that I did was I used Peter Bregman's 18 minutes a day and basically uh, what that would do is I had five minutes of reflection in the morning and then every hour on the hour I'd set my iPhone to beat me and then I would just get up and take a little stretch break um, walk around um, and then after a while, I didn't need the alarm because I, I trained my body to take these brain breaks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so in, in my day-to-day -day life, I'm a digital marketer. And so it's my job, along with my team, to be on my phone constantly, making sure that my clients, Facebook and Instagram and Twitter is well taken care of. And so I always am in sort of addiction denial and say, but it's my job. It's my job. So uh, a few things of using technology to remind you to get away from technology or at least to not pay so close attention is uh, installing software on your computer such as Desk Yogi or Fit Bolt. And both of them are exercise prompts that will ring a little alarm for you, pop up a little screen that shows you an exercise, and then you can push away from your desk and do a stretch. And that is like a great cue where technology then just says, hey, stop, stop what you're doing. I also have another app that just all of a sudden my iPhone just says, 
meditate it, right across the screen. So it stops me in my tracks. So having those kinds of cues can be really important. But the other thing is simply turn it off. Designate a time each day, several times a day, to literally power down. It's good for your phone. And it's good for your brain. And literally taking a that brain time, break. it takes a brain break and a phone break. It really, yes. it, t- it takes time to power down and it takes time to power back up. And during that time, truly just close your eyes or go, go walk down the hall, go get a glass of water, go outside, look out the window. There are, those little moments are incredibly valuable. And wow. one thing I would add to that, and we could talk about this all day, but um, forever. I know, like, <laughs> No, this is kind of like, it's like the same thing, like I'm going to go on a diet tomorrow and I'm not going to eat any more chocolate cookies because I have to lose 10 pounds. And you think about it, you know you need to do it, and then you don't do it. So what I would recommend is that you start with um, a method called Tiny Habits, which we describe in the book. It's from BJ Fogg. And to find the right trigger, you know, whether it's the alarm, whether it's a certain meeting time you have to go to, and Mm -hmm. to start with really small breaks and then build up. Yep. And so another thing is to join our online book club. We have a Facebook group, the Happy Healthy Nonprofit. You can see the URL up on the screen and uh, ask to join. We will let you in and we become accountability buddies to each other. And we are constantly letting people know about different articles that we're reading that are worth uh, paying attention to and uh, techniques that are working for us and one another and we can egg each other on and encourage each other. Yeah. I mean, we're constantly, we're constantly battling this. So, I mean, it's, we're not 100% <laughs> perfect. Yeah. We're, you know, we're trying to, we keep, Elisa and I keep each other honest. Um, and we fall we off the wagon yeah. and then we get back on. We do. Um, so we're all human. Yeah. We're all human. So it's good to have other people who are also working on the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Be kind listen. to yourself. Be gentle. Yeah. Yeah, thank thank you guys so much, um, especially for your time. I really appreciate it, and I'm sure everybody here appreciates it. And on that note, I want to uh, I've randomly selected one person to receive a free copy of the Happy Healthy Nonprofit, um, and that would be Lindsay Strong. So Lindsay, if you don't mind just sending me a quick email, John at JohnHayden.com, with your address, and I'll take care of all the details. And with that, um, do you guys have any closing? thoughts or uh, insights or anything like that you want to add? I think the I most important say... thing... Oh, go ahead. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Lisa, I'll say... follow you. <laughs> okay, perfect. I, I, yeah, I love it when Beth, Beth, does, Beth does the closing. The most important thing really is, like, well, like we said, be gentle and re- understand this is about self-respect first and once you take care of yourself everything transforms in your life and the way you work and you could be a fantastic influence on other people around you as well and what I want to say is that we hope that you will use self-care and hopefully we care to go from a constant state of stress into a constant state of calm and at the end of the day what's most important if you do invest in that you are investing in your mission and you're investing in your stakeholders and you will get better results. Brilliant. Thank you all so much. Thank you too. And thank you everybody who attended today. And uh, that's it. Thank you again, everybody for attending the, uh, the hump day coffee break. And this was one of my favorites actually. So um, enjoy the week and I'm going to, now I'm going to power down. I'm sure you guys are going to power down and take a break and go outside yeah, right. and take a walk. <laughs> right. I'm going for a walk right now. Got to get my steps in. <laughs> All right. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Okay. Bye.